90.3 WHPC now presents Law You Should Know. The law affects every aspect of our lives, our home, our jobs, and our recreational activities. Now, learn about the law and how to protect yourself against the loss of your liberty or property and learn how to stand up for your rights and seek compensation when you have been wronged. Your host for Law You Should Know is attorney Kenneth J. Landau, a past dean of the Nassau Academy of Law and frequently lectures to lawyers on ethics and avoiding problems with clients and to the public on how to choose and use lawyers. This is Law You Should Know on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome to Law You Should Know. Today, our guest is Beth Granger. She's an expert on LinkedIn and also is a trainer concerning networking, both traditional and newer ways to network, and on using LinkedIn to your advantage. She's also an expert on the growth of artificial intelligence, or AI, and how that's going to be important, has already become important, to the world of law and many other professions and and businesses as well. Beth, welcome to Law You Should Know. Thank you. Nice to be here. Let's just define what AI or artificial intelligence is before we discuss it further. So there are these tools, different types of tools that have gobbled up (laughs) all the information that they can find out there in the world on the internet and become tools that we can use for all different purposes. In a general way, how, how did AI start Where is it now and where will it be over the next few years? Ah, Well, there are so many different, we've all experienced dealing with automated systems or tools. And I think it's getting better and better. The quality of the results that we get are just getting better and better, faster and faster. And that's good and also maybe a little scary. When we call a, a credit card company or a bank or a, a retailer and we get a, an arrange of voicemail op- options and a voice trying to help us find the right place or resolve a problem, is that AI? I don't think of it that way. To me, that's just an automated response. But I guess because they're not ways, thinking, you think of it that because way. they're not right. th- they're not necessarily thinking. AI is like a brain. Or something with a brain. Right. It can it can analyze, it can give back information based on it's like having a conversation. In terms of lawyers, are some things that lawyers do or or bookkeepers or accountants or other professionals or knowledge workers going to be in je- jeopardized depending on what they do, what their function is because of the growth of AI? I like to look at it more that there'll be things that they don't need to do any more so that they can focus on where their expertise is important. So in terms of research, you know, you can ask AI to write a term paper, write a book, write a poem, write a legal brief, and then the worker is going and is, is going to have to improve it or ask AI to redraft it a little bit? Certainly, those are the kinds of things that people are already doing now in all different places. Um, I would never use just what it gives you because it's very dry and sometimes incorrect. Uh, it will it will tell you something that's wrong very confidently. Um, but I think where it can be really interesting is, one, if you have writer's block and you're just trying to get an idea, try to get some ideas out, it can compare information. It can summarize really well. So if you have a you know 200 page document and you just want a summary, you don't want to have to read the whole thing. It can do that really well. And so it can help analyzing you. contracts, for instance. And it can help you with your research. You know, that maybe the second stage would be the analysis or the drafting, but it can certainly help you with the research. Yes, yes. There was an article recently in the New York Times, and somebody said that they had, it was able to go through a very long document, either holes in it, or I forget the exact details, but find something that it would have taken that person hours to read and find. So we could go through a trial transcript, it can go through a hospital record, it can go through other information and find the the, the data points you're concerned with very quickly. Yes. And it, 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 I guess it can also analyze that to see, uh, to marshal the arguments or uh, to look for flaws, so to speak, or to write rebuttals. And where I think it's going to be interesting is, will be the tools that people make to sit on top of it. So very specific tools for doing very specific things. And what do you mean by that? So um, even now, for instance, I've I've played with some plugins and there's one that 
will, if you go to a web page, it will summarize what the, what the content on that web page for you really easily. So you don't have, if you don't want to read the whole thing or it's pretty impressive. You could also ask it to summarize the articles from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or some other reference material about I'm a not sure point, you know. if the that specific plugin will do that it, I'm not sure what types I haven't tried it on anything like that so it may but it may not what issues is AI going to create I mean I, I've seen some writings about the the intellectual property the right to use the the work that someone that's copyright and that someone spent a lot of time and trouble and, and money to write yeah that I'm very concerned by that um, I mean, I love new technology, but there's always the other side of the coin. So there's that. There's the fact that it may give somebody incorrect information and they might use it or believe it. And and also, will it sort of, if people are taking the information that it gives them and then putting it back out on the internet, is the quality of everything that we find going to be lessened if, because we're not if we're just taking it as it's given and not making it better. So it's not verified, it's it's not uh, checked for a- applicability or things along that line. Exactly. So, and there is there a danger in that, just relying on AI, whether we're in the world of law or medicine or engineering? I think so. It can do a lot of things, but I think a human needs to, at least right now, a human certainly needs to check it. And on the flip side, should we ask AI to check our work for accuracy, for proof, uh, sufficient proof, uh, rebuttal, whatever it is? It would be an interesting experiment to see what it comes up with, certainly. And and I, I also think of, for instance, in the medical field, humans reviewing um, medical scan after medical scan looking for something, and people get tired and distracted, and technology doesn't. So... There may be things that it can do really well at some point. If it can't already, then I just don't know about it. And especially in the gray area where, you know, where it's not jumping out at the, let's say, the radiologist, you know, to, to just get them to focus on it or suggest a possible a possibility to them. Or even exactly. in, in trying to be a disease detective, just to, you know, look for possible related uh, areas or areas for further testing. Exactly. With that, there's a certain interaction you know, with the doctor professionals and uh, AI. Yes. You see that happening in law or economics or or other learned fields as well. Yeah, absolutely. You touched on it before, but what are some of the potential dangers of AI? One has to do with confidentiality or data privacy, right? People are putting information in and asking these tools to analyze it, and it's taking that information in. So you certainly wouldn't want to put something that you don't want out in the world, private information. I wouldn't want to put that in a tool as it is today, for sure. And some of it may be protected by other, by patents or other, other copyrights or other intellectual safeguards. Yeah. And of course, we already talked about that you can't always be certain that the information it's giving you is correct. Let's carry it one step further, Ken. Uh, you know, we talked about the writing functions, perhaps the analysis function, perhaps even crafting an argument on both sides of the law. What about the judgment functions? Can we trust AI to make a decision to reach the right decision or a Solomonian decision? It's a really good question. Um, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I mean, I, part of me thinks that maybe it can be less biased than a human, but then humans have made it so our biases are naturally in it well if you had to make a decision about buying a house or buying a car is there a way you can have ai make the decision for you or tell you the pros and cons you should consider yeah absolutely but again it's it's using information that it finds out in the world already and even on a medical issue or medical judgment it should not take away the the doctor or the patient or the the back and forth between them I agree. Do we reach an area where there are potential dangers of AI in uh, controlling things, in only in in slanting its response, in uh, taking control of something, or our, or our mind, or our ability to decide things? Well, I'm a big sci-fi fan, so I've seen movies and read books about all the possible things that could happen. Um, I suppose so. I mean, even just becoming dependent on it. Right. If we get used to using a tool instead of using our own skills, 
do we lose those skills? And we're going to come back to that in a second. And, and how can we manage AI rather than AI managing us? I'd just like to remind our listeners, we're talking about artificial intelligence and its future in the law and other fields. And as you can see, it's a very complicated and very uh, contemporary issue. Our guest is Beth Granger. She is an expert trainer and a consultant on LinkedIn. And she has also helped guiding her clients through the process of working with and appropriately utilizing artificial intelligence. And you're listening to Law You Should Know here on 90.3 WHPC, the voice of National Community College in Garden City, Long Island, New York. If you missed any portion of this program, please just go to the podcast or feel free to tell other people about the podcast at nccradio.org. So what do you think are going to be the next few steps in the evolution of AI, Beth? Oh, well, like I said before, I think people building tools on top of the tools that already exist. In fact, in that article I mentioned, they already mentioned two um, tools for lawyers. One was called Case Text and the other was called Harvey, I think. The the Case Text one, I, when I took a look at that, it does document review, research memos, deposition prep, and contract analysis. And that's pretty interesting. And it's going to bring key phrases or potential ambiguity or perhaps flaws or mistakes to the attention of the, the lawyer or the party involved. Hopefully. And yeah. hopefully the lawyers will use it before they finalize the contract just to see as a way of proofing it. And I guess afterward, if they have to litigate over it, it might give them some starting points. I, I moderated a panel on um, social media and I, AI and somebody described it like um, an intern that doesn't need to sleep, but sometimes made, makes mistakes and needs guidance. And I thought that was a really great way to think of it. Or maybe just need, maybe it's not mistakes, but they just need guardrails. That there are certain uh, things that are appropriate and some that may, you know, may, may not be appropriate right. in a particular situation. Anything else that lawyers should consider, other professionals, other industries, using more AI to safeguard their work, to uh, foolproof their work, et cetera? Well, I think they they have to be careful about, I, I think it can be a very valuable tool, but I wouldn't want anybody to rely on it completely and assume that it's right. Even for instance, when right now, and it may get better at this, but right now it will, you'll ask for a citation where it got this information and it'll just make things up. And there's also accountability. What happens if you rely on AI for something that you do and it goes wrong? So I think, like you said, the guardrails and using it for what it's good at, but not for what a human In a is. sense, we have to manage AI or it's going to manage us. Now, for people providing these services, whether it's a paralegal, a young attorney, an outside firm in the U.S., or perhaps outsourced to India or the Philippines, is it going to eliminate their jobs or change the nature of their jobs? Let's say for knowledge workers. Yeah, I imagine it will change the nature of some jobs. I don't think it would necessarily eliminate them because it can just make things easier. It's like, like I said, having an intern, right? Having somebody that can do some of the things or at least get you started on some of the things. And yeah. And the writing process, the research process may be streamlined and, and sped up. So the client, the lawyer or other professional may save time and the client in turn may, may save time. Yeah. In the and when there are tools, project, yeah. when there are tools to, and they may already exist, but to analyze your internal data. So for instance, if you have, you could look at all of one type of document that you've ever done and see commonalities or see where there's something that's inconsistent. I think that could be really interesting. I just want to make a moment to talk about the other fields you're involved with and the work that you do. How do you help lawyers and other, other professionals and, and business people with, let's say, networking issues? A couple of things. I facilitate a council of a networking group. And um, when I work with professionals, it tends to be in connecting that with their the work that they do on LinkedIn. So for instance, if you ask me for an introduction to a real estate attorney, suddenly my mind goes blank. But if I teach you how to search on LinkedIn and find specific names, you could come to me and say, Beth, I see you know these three people. Can you make an introduction? And they would search what on LinkedIn? They would search your your contacts, your network? 
So they can search in general, just a general search, and then see who knows that person that they might want to know. Or yes, if they're connected with me, they can search just in my connections. Is that helping clients to find trusted advisors and, and you know and people to find clients? Yeah, yeah, because a, a specific request is just is more likely to get. It's like the old fashioned phone call or conversation about who would you call or do you know someone yep. who's an expert in that field? Exactly. What types of training do you provide lawyers or others? So everything from just the basics of how to use LinkedIn and networking for their goals to how to engage on LinkedIn, how to get their thought leadership across, how to do all the different things that LinkedIn is really good for, even how to hire in some cases. And what is the intersection of artificial intelligence and LinkedIn? Yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. LinkedIn's actually been playing with that a little bit. They have something called collaborative articles where AI writes the article and then they're asking people to add to the article. I'm not so impressed with that yet. To me, it's the articles are pretty bad. It, it would be just as easy to say, here's the topic and everybody put your thoughts in. But I think they are experimenting with doing things. They already have something where you can um, practice your interviewing skills and it assesses it. So I think, I think there'll be some interesting things that they'll add to the tool itself. And are you using AI to be the interviewer or, or the interviewee? Interviewee. Could you ask AI to be the interviewer? Or we're not at that, we're not there yet. I don't know. You know, to I ask the questions. I haven't tried that, so I don't know. Well, would you want to be replaced by AI in conducting the interview? No. Okay. <laughs> no, because you, you're processing things a certain way. You're, you're generating follow-up. You're deciding what you want to know more about. And I don't know if, if there's a, a set way to do it, but you're following your instincts. Yeah. So do you think AI can ever, at least in, in the, at the present time or in the near future, can ever recreate that? Can ever, where you're a facilitator and you are, you're helping humans to do better, and you're helping to calm them and to teach them. Can AI replace that right now? So far, I've found that all the tools, the information that you get is very generic and very basic. So, you, you know, it can give you a 10-part list on things you should do for a specific thing, but it's not the same as a human where you can ask them a question where you can debate how you should do something Um and so you can have it. You can have a give and take, and you can have a counseling function if you're working with a client. Yes. So the what AI might do is is might be generic and and basic, and they might you know miss that humor interaction signal. Yeah, it's really all about so far. It's really all about the prompts that you give it. So you can say when you get a response, you can say I'd like that more serious, or I'd like that funnier, or so it feels conversational, but it's not a conversation. Could you have it analyze or improve a speech you were going to give as opposed to, an, you know, it reviewing an article? I've never tried it, but I don't see why not. And it could analyze your delivery of a speech and give you suggestions on that as opposed to, you know, the written text of the speech. Well, there's a tool right now called uh, Udly, and it does, I haven't tried it, but I know some people that have used it, and it will analyze your, when you're on a Zoom meeting, it will join the Zoom meeting and it will analyze your speaking. What? How is it analyzing it? I don't know because I've never used it. Okay. I've just seen people use it. And is it giving you suggestions on how to improve it? I would think so, yeah. I'd have to check but, but it out you could, You as an experienced business person could probably give that person feedback. Oh, yeah, of course. And then based on their reaction, you can, you know, you're, you're, you could moderate your feedback a little bit or folk, you know, fine-tune your feedback. Yeah. And can AI do something like that? I don't see why not. Okay. <laughs> it can do a lot of things. It just has to learn, I think. Well, that's the key thing. It, it took yeah. you a lot of experience in business to get to where you are. <laughs> and and AI, you know, I'm not sure it can, you know, catch up as quickly someday, but I, I don't know about right now. I'd like to remind the listeners we're talking with Beth Granger. She's an expert on LinkedIn and uh, she's a trainer and consultant to businesses and individuals and lawyers. And we're talking to her about the growth of AI, artificial intelligence, and the legal profession and other businesses and uh, how we've got to manage it and uh, use it. 
You're listening to Law You Should Know on WHBC 90.3, the voice of NASA Community College in Garden City, New York. If you missed any portion of this program, you can find a podcast or tell someone else about it at nccradio.org. And what you are hearing is not a product of artificial intelligence. We have two human beings just having a conversation with each other. But maybe someday we'll have a we'll interview artificial intelligence or maybe artificial intelligence will conduct the interview. Now Beth, can artificial intelligence conduct a meaningful dynamic interview, let's say in a law office or uh, some kind of other firm? I haven't tried it to know, but it'd be an interesting thing to experiment with. I think it's in a very we're in a very experimental time and people should try it and see what happens. Now, as a human interviewing someone or having a conversation with someone as a lawyer or in your field, you're trying to build a connection with that person and and maybe sell something and and go beyond the spoken word, look for gestures, look for uncertainty, try to, you know, get a little background. Can AI do all that at the moment? Aside from just recording answers. I think it can do some very interesting things, yeah. But it's all based on what's been put into it. Right. And it turns about what's been put into it. Who is programming something like that? Where would they get the ideas from, the knowledge from? Who who would they take it from? Because interviewers can vary. And people may not agree on what the the best interviewing style is. That's a good question, right? The more examples they put into any system, the better it will be. Are your programs, the the things you oversee on LinkedIn and and other business resources available for lawyers or other business people to join? Yes. Yes. And can you tell us how they can get in touch with you to find out more about those opportunities? Sure. Well, of course, I'm on LinkedIn and um, I have a website, bethgranger.com. And that's G-R-A-N-G-E-R. Correct. And what if, what other background information do you have on your, your website, useful information to lawyers or other business people that they would find on your website? So I do have an interesting a webinar that people can replay called Nine LinkedIn Landmines. So things not to do on LinkedIn, the behavior that can damage your reputation. And let's talk for a minute about what some of them are and that lawyers and others should avoid. So we've all experienced the least favorite behavior, which is the connect and pitch. And that's where you connect with somebody typically that you don't know. And immediately they're sending you a pitch trying to sell their services. People hate that. And I don't advise doing it. And I I see that's part of a lot of online groups. They, you know, it's a networking group of people in a certain business or background, not for really making pitches, just for providing support or answers to common concerns. So what are some other don'ts on LinkedIn or, or do's? So another don't is you can mention somebody, tag somebody in when you're doing a post and they'll be notified. And that's a wonderful thing. And sometimes people will do it because they want people to see the post. They want people to engage with the post. But I had an instance where I met somebody new and they started tagging me on every single post they did. It could have been, I just learned how to change a tire and they were tagging me hoping that I would engage and it got annoying. Let me just ask you about the length of the, the post and the scope of the post. Do people sure. post about too many things and that they post too much about one thing or the, or the people have a lot of time to read all this and respond to it? So it depends how active people are on the platform. And it can feel, if you don't have a lot of connections who share content, for instance, it can feel like you're always seeing the same people over and over. But that could just be because of your network or because you've engaged with that content in the past. So I wouldn't, as somebody creating content, I wouldn't worry about doing too much. I mean, should you keep it simple and to the point rather than longer and extraneous? Oh, I mean, it should, you should use the space that you need to get your point across. That could be one sentence. That could be an article. And do people expect everyone to, you know, give a thumbs up or comment on everything they see? Does that help you make you look better? And should you react to it in some way to draw attention to your own self or your company? So if people engage with your content, yes, that's good. It helps the algorithm look at it and say, let's show this to more people. So if you want to support, for instance, a referral partner, if you engage with their content, that is a way to support them. And how should you want people to support you on LinkedIn? Well, my does someone, does someone is, have to say thank you for your post? Does that get repetitive after a time or acknowledging something? Well, I always like to think of it as we're in a room together and we're having a conversation. And if I said that thing that I put in the post, 
what would you say back? You probably wouldn't just say thank you. You might say, oh, that's really interesting. What about this? It would be a conversation. I, I agree. But if there's 25 people in the room, would you want everyone to sit through 25 congratulations going around the room? <laughs> Sometimes. When okay. it's a really exciting thing to be congratulated okay. on, sure. And what's your final thought or advice about LinkedIn? Don't be afraid of it. Jump in and use it. I'd like to thank Beth Granger. As you've heard, she's she's introduced us to artificial intelligence, AI, and she's also talked to us about the do's and don'ts of LinkedIn. And you can find out more information about her networking groups and other services by going to Beth Granger. That's G-R-A-N-G-E-R dot com. If you missed any portion of this podcast or you want to tell someone else about it, just go to nccradio.org. And please join us next week at this same time on 90.3, the voice of Nassau Community College, WHPC, at nccradio.org.